Okay, so uh, welcome everybody uh, to the Alan uh, Memorial Freedom Festival. Uh, to, uh, I'm uh, really glad that you all, uh, you all came. Uh, my name is Christoph Kozak, I'm the head of the Department of uh, American Studies. Uh, and uh, today is the opening event of our uh, basically uh, of our festival that goes on for uh, two weeks. Our main uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, can you hear me without the mic? Even in the back? No, okay, it's better than mine. Uh, Alright, um, so uh, our uh, main star of the uh, of the event is uh, Professor uh, Ralph Young from Temple University and we will be uh, patronizing his book on descent and uh, he will introduce uh, the, introduce the book. Um, and after that, we will all get some uh, refreshments, uh, basically thanks to uh, the U.S. Uh, Embassy, which provided a generous um, a generous grant uh, and contributed a uh, uh, lot to it. And we are thankful for them because uh, without this money, <coughs> it, the festival would be held at the Unisa campus. Nobody would show up and it would be a boring. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, without further ado, I want to introduce the festival. Uh, the whole, um, um, the whole idea is uh, that we are celebrating uh, 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 the <clears throat> uh, kind of like the, one of the key moments of, of the Prague Spring when Anna um, Ginsberg, an American, was crowned as the leader of May in communist Czechoslovakia. Um, and uh, how do we connect to this end? It's the, uh, it, the connection lies in the fact that the American authorities, they didn't like Ginsberg at all. And Ginsburg didn't like the American authorities as well. And at the same time, so uh, he ended up in Czechoslovakia, and he was very critical of the Czechoslovak authorities. Even you know, the Prague Spring is going on, so things are supposed to be better. But for Ginsburg, not good enough, and he's criticizing the Czechoslovak government. So he ends up being expelled uh, from Czechoslovakia. Uh, so uh, you can see that uh, the idea of this and so sort of connects. The, uh, you know, connects uh, Czechs, uh, uh, Czechs and Americans, and it's no accident that we are in uh, the last of the uh, library who is uh, famous uh, Czech. Uh, uh, Czech uh, so, uh, uh, I do, uh, in my two uh, other events um, that will be happening uh, next, uh, next week, on Tuesday we'll be at the American Center uh, with Carl Browns, who is a, a very famous LGBT. Activist, he was like fighting for gay rights even before it was popular, so his life was uh, kind of difficult. But uh, he, he's famous in the US because he was the person uh, who was uh, pushing for, uh, you know, uh, pushing for this uh, even uh, before it became cool and popular. Uh, All right, like, uh, uh, change. Uh, so he will be the main guest of that event. Uh, and then on Thursday, at the Faculty of Arts, uh, we will have. I think the most academic aspect of the festival, we have like a lot of people, Josef Yasha, uh, uh, Justin Quinn, uh, Eric Rana, uh, uh, George Toll, talking about uh, Ginsburg and um, uh, how he can be connected um, uh, to problems of today. And uh, uh, the final event is going to be held on the Victory Day, uh, and it's supposed to be sort of like Ginsburg's victory. Uh, on May 8th uh, uh, at 2 p.m., the good thing is that it will be a sort of <coughs> fun promenade through the storm of the park with like some signs uh, in the spirit of uh, Prague Spring. Like uh, the theme is like Prague Spring 2.0 and Ginsburg is uh, the young Ginsburg will be there. Uh, so it would be a celebration of like what if Ginsburg uh, wouldn't have been evicted from Czechoslovakia? What if Ginsburg uh, would have come to Prague today? What would he do? So, uh, and it's, you know, that's a good event for, you know, you can take your kids. Uh, and it's going to be uh, uh, in the end, uh, in the evening there will be um, an official sort of uh, ending with some round table at the uh, Arena uh, at the um, uh, uh, election. For uh, the students who are interested in partying, uh, after the American Center, I forgot to mention, uh, there will be a big party in a studio room uh, close by where uh, Ralph Young is going to play the guitar and to explain the blues and other things. <laughs> um, uh, okay, uh, and uh, now I can, Mike, I want to show you uh, basically uh, three little things. I will begin first. Uh, oh, 
trotzdem. Sorry. Now the mic might be actually useful. Um, and we have a we have a Facebook site, and I wanted to show it to you that you know I'm not a big fan of like big you know, corporations collecting our personal data, but um, uh, for uh, some things it's actually very useful because you can find and want to uh, we actually want it you know we have a news so it's going to be a big event. Uh, I'll show you our you know our competition for the best photo from 1965 taken in 2005. Uh, we already, uh, already posted some pictures there, but the important thing is these are the original um, posters, original Czech music from 1965. Um, and um, I want to get to the Kermsch uh, Ring. We actually uh, wanted to show the, the whole howl with nice animation and letters. So you can actually read the poem. It's available on YouTube. It's 14 minutes, but I, I highly recommend uh, these uh, 14 um, and the last thing, uh, I don't know why we are, we, are, we should be black and white, but uh, so this is more like, that's weird. No. Uh, so these are some of my friends playing cards. <laughs> uh, these are some of the kids we know. Um, these are some of the nice ladies we know. That's uh, actually my son. <laughs> Like in 65, this is a PhD called Clean and the Department of Learning Studies. Now, this is like uh, we're doing some projects. Okay, this is the main organizer in all of all the events, so thank you. <laughs> um, it's my uh, cousin. So you can see, you can uh, play with this thing. And it's, it's open, the username is uh, Ginsberg, the password is Ginsberg Ginsberg. It's on Facebook, you know, on Facebook you have these um, uh, this passwords. Uh, it's actually my, uh, uh, my grandmother, which is uh, nice picture for, for church, it's my wife. Okay? <laughs> uh, so, uh, you see, it can be fun, it's like, yeah, uh, uh, it's my brother. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Um, so uh, you can see you can uh, you can uh, play with uh, with this. And we have played very few So um, uh, I think I think now we can go back to our presentation. Um, and uh, so uh, with this, um, you know, uh, welcome, and I give the floor uh, to Rob. Thank you very much. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank uh, Christoph and the Carlo University for inviting me and the American Embassy for helping pay for all the stuff that's going on. And uh, it's really kind of wonderful to be here, and especially in such great weather, except for yesterday it was a little bit tough. But. So, uh, we're, you, and actually at some point during this festival, probably next week, I'll have to tell you guys the story about the time I did spend a day with Allen Ginsberg, I actually met him, and uh, he's one of the people that I've dedicated the book to, um, along with Pete Seeger, another one of my heroes of American descent. And so I just want to tell a little bit about the book and uh, the basic subject of this, and that is that uh, when I began to put this together, and basically I, I put together a course at Temple University on this subject, basically looking at American history through the lens of dissent, through the eyes of dissenters, of people that didn't go along with the power structure. And uh, so I, I put together a course, I eventually put together a book of documents about dissent, and then this book now is my narrative history, you know, in my own voice of what uh, America means and what dissent means to America and what America did for dissent. And it's basically the theme of the book is that dissent is central to American history. The nation was born out of dissent and it's continued all the way through its uh, roughly 400 year history. And um, you know, we had religious dissenters in Europe coming over in the 17th century, settling in colonies. You had Puritans in Massachusetts, Quakers in Pennsylvania. And so that's one of the types of dissent that there is, is religious dissent. Uh, by the 18th century, you had political dissenters rising up and dissenting against parliament and king, dissenting primarily against taxes at first, uh, which everybody seems to like to dissent against. But eventually, that dissent led to the American Revolution. And then we put that into our Constitution, in the First Amendment, that we have the right to dissent. And Americans haven't shut up since. <laughs> They've dissented about every topic under the sun. You know, women protested to get the right to vote. Abolitionists protested against slavery. After the Civil War, you had civil rights activists protesting against the Jim Crow laws. You had Indians protesting against their condition. You had workers protesting to have the right to dissent and the right to unionize and to organize. Uh, you had uh, every single war in American history has had dissenters against it, including the American Revolution and the Civil War on both sides. World War II even, which in America many people refer to that as the good war, as if a war could be ever good. But it was, you know, when you compare it to Vietnam and other wars which were very highly uh, morally questionable that we got into, that's kind of what Americans are talking about when they talk about World War II. Uh, you've had the gay rights movement, environmentalism, uh, you know, women after they finally got the right to vote, you know, you have second wave feminism. So, you, know, you name it, and, and protest has been very much a part of it. And one of the basic themes that I have is that dissent is the fuel for the engine of progress. You know, it's because the power structure doesn't want to change. There's a basic inertia to the power structure. And people on the outside have to push and to get in order to get change. 
So let me just kind of you know, very quickly go through some of the points that I make in the book and to show how this all connects together. And one of the things you, know, you, you have even in uh, the colonial period, uh, you know, one of the first, you know, no sooner had Massachusetts Bay Colony been settled when you had Roger Williams dissenting against the Puritan authorities in the colony. And one of the things he protested against was that there was too much intolerance, intolerance of religious liberty. You know, when you know, the Puritans had left England so that they could practice and worship the way they wished, but they weren't going for the concept of religious liberty because they didn't believe that other people should have religious liberty. Uh, they went for the concept that they should have their religious liberty. And you know, one of the things that William says in, in his book, The uh, Bloody Tent of Persecution, that uh, violence and a sword of steel get such an impression in the suburbs that they conclude and that religion cannot be true, which needs such means, such instruments of violence to uphold itself. So he's arguing that the Puritans should allow other viewpoints of religion to exist. He was also against the close connection between church and state in colonial Massachusetts. He argued vehemently for the separation of church and state. Both of these principles are ensconced in the American Constitution. So here, about 150 years before the Constitution is even written, uh, you have dissent going on within the colonies that are creating or influencing the document that is going to be one of the major founding documents of the United States. You also have, so basically one of the, you know, the arguments that I have is that the United States was founded by dissent, so that, for example, back during the Vietnam War when I was one of the anti-war protesters, and people would say, you're unpatriotic. I would say, no, I am patriotic. You know, to dissent is patriotic. There's nothing that is more American than dissent and protesting, because we were born out of it. During the Revolution, this is Abigail Adams. Are you guys familiar with John and Adam, Abigail Adams? I was telling my class yesterday about this, where when he was in Philadelphia working on the Declaration of Independence with Franklin and Jefferson, uh, his wife writes him, you know, I basically, in the new code of laws by which I suppose it would be necessary for you to make, I desire you to remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Very clearly, she's making this argument that, okay, now we have this new idea of liberty and equality that we're fighting revolution for, and this should be for everybody. This should be for the women as well as the men. And of course, this was in 1776 she wrote this. When did women get the right to vote in America? 1920. 1920. So, 150 years roughly before this even comes to pass. You know, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. This is you know, basically the argument the men were using against London, against Parliament, against the King. Um, of course, John Adams' reply We've been told that our struggle has loosened the bands of government everywhere. You can you know, just read that for yourself. But your letter was the first intimation that another tribe, more numerous and powerful than all the rest, were grown discontented. This is rather too coarse a compliment. They were so saucy. You understand that word? Um, so, you know, she's just kind of you know laughed at you know. Of course, we're not going to repeat all our masculine systems and all of this. Uh, but it shows that there's this effort already, right from the beginning of the founding of the United States, that women are not going to remain quiet. 
Thoreau. You know, I was just talking today in class about Henry David Thoreau and the Transcendentalists, and some of the uh, lines that he says. You know, he, this is a great quota quotation here. He says, the mass of men serve the state mainly as machines with their bodies. Uh, and they are esteemed good citizens. Others, as legislators, politicians, lawyers, ministers, serve the state chiefly with their heads. And as they rarely make any moral distinctions, they are as likely to serve the devil. Very few, very few, serve the state with their consciences and so necessarily resist it. If you serve the state with your conscience, you have to resist. And for the most part, they are commonly treated by enemies by it. And Thoreau goes on to say that he is a friend of the state because he resists the state. You're trying to make the state better to live up to its ideals. And, and one of the things I found throughout writing this book is that dissenters in all ages are constantly going back and referring to the founding documents. They're referring to the Constitution, to the Declaration of Independence, and they're treating them as though they are a contract. The government has promised us that we are all equal, that we all have these rights, and some people have found that they don't have those rights. And so they're holding the United States government to be true to what it wrote down in the Constitution and the Declaration. Um, Thoreau, you know, as you know, as you know, he famously went to prison and protesting against the the war against Mexico, because when the United States went to war with Mexico, it was to expand slavery, and he felt that in his conscience, he could not support that. Um, William Lloyd Garrison was a, uh, a, an abolitionist. Are you guys familiar with Garrison? He published, sorry, in 1831, The Liberator. And one time he was arrested, he was put in jail to safeguard him from a mob that was trying to lynch him. And he wrote this graffiti on the cell wall uh, and, and when he was arrested. And it's, it's one of my favorite quotes from him. He says he was put into the cell to save him from the violence of a respectable and influential mob who sought to destroy him for preaching the abominable and dangerous doctrine that all men are created equal. You know, another example of referring to the founding documents. Many people dissented against the system that existed in the United States. For example, you know, abolitionists were fighting slavery with their pamphlets and essays and demonstrations. Slaves were resisting it through refusing to work. Uh, you had that term as rebellion. Thirty-one slaves rising up and killing a number of their masters, but of course all of the slave rebellions were very violently put down and repressed. Um, but still, they kept fighting. You also had, uh, Af you know, African Americans like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, who you know, Harriet Harry Tubman was one of the leaders of the Underground Railroad. Frederick Douglass was a leading black abolitionist. He had escaped from slavery in the Underground Railroad and then went around the country preaching uh, against slavery. Uh, you had, of course, John Brown. Now here's an example. You know, one of the things that I talk about in my classes and I talk about in the book is that most people, especially after Thoreau's ideas and Martin Luther King's ideas are in favor of nonviolent protest. But John Brown was a violent dissenter. Uh, you probably know the stories of how he went into Kansas and murdered a lot of uh, pro slavery settlers. And then in Harper's Ferry, you know, his attempt to arm the slaves and lead a revolution against slavery, you know, which wound up in his execution. Uh, but he was, 
He believed that slavery should be ended instantly. We have, of course, the women's movement was a very significant thing that grew out of all of this in the 19th century. You know, Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and uh, they had the, in 1848, they had the Seneca Falls Convention in which they wrote this Declaration of Sentiments, uh, which was a rewrite of the Declaration of Independence, but kind of degenderizing it by, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. And then in the part where Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence writes all of the, lists all of the crimes that George III has committed against the colonists, they write all the crimes that men have committed against women by withholding from her the elective franchise and such. Um, even during the Civil War, this is kind of one of the ironic things about dissent. You had dissenters on both sides. And in the United States, people really highly revere Lincoln. Lincoln. In fact, this month was the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's assassination. Uh, and yet, Lincoln uh, kind of basically broke parts of the Constitution. He suspended the writ of habeas corpus. He found out that legislators in, in, in Maryland were planning to vote on a, uh, a document to secede from the Union. And so he had the governor of Maryland, the mayor of Baltimore, and half of the legislators thrown in jail without charges for several months until the crisis passed over. And one of the congressmen, you know, Clement L. Valendigo, uh, really criticized Lincoln for becoming a tyrant and for basically breaking the Constitution and breaking constitutional liberties. He authorized the complete uh, spying on telegraphs. Of course, telephone hadn't yet been invented. And they were basically tapping all the telegraph messages that were being going on in the country. Sort of something like what Edward Snowden has kind of revealed in, in recent times. And it's kind of interesting that when you read about dissent and you look at the history of it, some things do repeat themselves over and over again. Recently, I saw um, you know, a photograph of a recent demonstration where some guy's carrying a sign that says, I can't believe we're still protesting this shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, we thought we solved this years ago. <laughs> Indians fought against their treatment and demanded that they should be treated equally just as Jefferson had promised in the Declaration of Independence. You know, he says here, all men were made by the same great spirit truth. They were all brothers. The earth is the mother of all people. All people should have equal rights upon it. You know, almost coming from enlightenment thinking, you know, what, what he's saying here. Um, Carl Schurz, you guys familiar with the Spanish-American War? Uh, an ironic war because the United States went to war with Spain in order to help Cuba get its independence. And the result of the war is that the United States is fighting an imperial power, gets, helps get Cuban independence, and then becomes an imperial power itself. We take over the Philippines, we take over Guantanamo Bay, we take over Guam and Puerto Rico. And even a Republican, Carl Schurz was very condemning of President William McKinley for doing this. And you can see this, if we become an imperialist power, we shall transform the government of the people for the people and by the people into a government of one part of the people, the strong over the weak. He says this. And he also says, I want to warn the American people that a democracy cannot so deny its faith as to the vital conditions of its being. It cannot only play the king over subject populations without creating within itself ways of thinking and habits of action most dangerous to its own vitality. So that, you know, 
he's critical of what we're doing because we're going against one of our central principles, which was the consent of the government, self-rule. This was what the American Revolution was supposedly all about. And there were many people that were protesting against America is taking over the, the Philippines at the time. Uh, during World War One, you guys are perhaps familiar with Woodrow Wilson's administration passing the Sedition and Espionage Acts and uh, attempting to kind of unify America <laughs> behind the war. And uh, there were many people that protested that. Protesting the and it's a it's a trend that goes all through American history, by the way. When the United States is at war, basically free speech just starts to be infringed on. If people protest against the war, like because of the Sedition and Espionage Acts, people were arrested. Something like two thousand Americans were arrested in 1918 for protesting against the war. Simply, they didn't even do anything violent or anything like that, but they protested. People were so angry about that that they began publicly going to Central Park in New York and reading the Bill of Rights, that we have freedom of speech, and getting arrested for it. You know, the irony of that, you know, getting arrested for reading the, the um, Bill of Rights. H.L. Mencken in the 1920s said that imagine a, uh, the Pope denouncing somebody because they believe in the divinity of Christ. You know, it's like Americans denounce free speech the moment we are under threat in a, in a war. And of course, uh, Eugene V. Debs, the great American socialist leader, uh, some of my favorite quotes from him, and he was arguing that we shouldn't be in the war and that people like him who protested the war are considered to be unpatriotic. And of course he says here, you know, patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. He's referring, you know, quoting Sam Johnson, but you know, for every age has been the tyrant, the oppressor, and the exploiter who has wrapped himself in the cloak of patriotism or religion or both to deceive and overawe the people. And I'm sure you guys are probably very familiar with the same kind of stuff that happens over here, you know, with people wrapping themselves in patriotism and, and religion to manipulate people into, into war. Oh, in the 1950s, you had uh, the McCarthy hearings, the anti-communist hysteria and one of the great protesters against that was Margaret J. Smith, a Republican again, from Maine, who protested against the way McCarthy was trying to you know, paint everybody with this red paintbrush and destroying careers and livelihoods and not really ever own, you know, you know, turning up any kind of plot against the United States. Uh, you had you know, Pete Seeger, one of my heroes, as I mentioned. Uh, you guys familiar with Pete Seeger? He wrote Where Have All the Flowers Gone. He was responsible for this We Shall Overcome, uh, If I Had a Hammer. And uh, he was called in front of the House Committee on American Activities, and they asked if he was a communist or who was a communist. And most people that were called in front of the committee that had to answer that question, they usually plead, pled the Fifth Amendment. You guys understand? Pleading the Fifth, what does that mean? That you have not to incriminate yourself. So Pete Seeger refused to answer that question, not on the grounds of the Fifth Amendment, but on the grounds of the First Amendment. Free speech, he said, you have no right to ask me that question. That's like you walking into the voting booth with me and looking over my shoulder as I'm voting. So he was blacklisted. He was, you know, uh, arrested for contempt of Congress and all this, and couldn't perform his songs on 
television or radio for 17 years, and yet other people like Peter, Paul, and Mary, and John Baez, and others were recording his songs, and they were getting out there and wound up having a huge influence on the folk music revival and the uh, radical 60s in the United States. And it's quite interesting about this kind of music, and I'll be talking about this next week too, is that uh, it really gets the message out there. You have mainstream media that's presenting one message, but folk songs are giving sort of the contrary message. And it gets out there and it, and it resonates, and people hear songs and they keep it in their heads and it unites them. A couple of years ago, during the Occupy movement, a reporter from the New York Times called me up to interview me and wanted to know why there were no protest songs being written during the Occupy movement, like it was during the civil rights and the anti-war movement. And it suddenly struck me, and I, don't, I actually don't know how really true this is, but the insight I suddenly had at that moment is that basically folk music then was the social media of the day. Today, there's Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff that gets the other message out, the counter message. And so maybe the music isn't as needed now as it was then. There wasn't that type of social media then. But so I like to think now of the protest songs of the 60s as sort of the social media that time. And then, of course, we have Allen Ginsberg, who was one of the really significant you know, uh, poets and thinkers. And what's so interesting about Allen Ginsberg, he was an absolute individualist and a very political animal at the same time. And he kind of sort of kicks off this time of the late 50s and the 60s, where uh, what became very common as far as protesters was concerned in the 60s was that the, the personal is political and the political is personal. You can't separate those two. And this becomes a very important part of the whole message that happens in the 60s. And in the 60s, it was like so many Americans took all of the promises from the founding documents very seriously and pushed and pushed and pushed against the powers that be until there was change, until they began to have change. And as you know, by the time we get to the mid-60s, this is beginning to have an influence around the world. You know, American music is influencing what's going on in Europe. And you have like phenomenon in Europe, like the Beatles coming on the scene. You have Ginsburg's famous visit to Prague in 1965, where, as Christoph was saying, you know, the American authorities didn't like Ginsburg, and the Soviet authorities didn't like Ginsburg. He was like the, the ultimate dissenter. He was against all of that kind of authoritarian structure, whether it was so-called democracy or so-called socialism or communism. And so it becomes, you know, a, a huge influence. And, you know, when you think of the Cold War and the arms race and the United States building all these weapons and the Soviets building all these weapons, you know, what ended the Cold War? It wasn't all of that atomic stock, stockpile. You know, it was the, the soft power, the you know, people like Ginsburg or Bob Dylan and, uh, you know, some Hollywood movies and Microsoft and all of this stuff coming on the scene. I remember in, I visited Prague for the very first time in August 1969. And I was with a student group and we were in Vienna. And the only way you could get in as an American was with a group and then a bus and it was a very controlled kind of visit. And they brought us into Prague. It was a Friday night and we had checked into the hotel and we, I went out and I was walking around Wenceslas 
square. And there was nobody, nobody on the streets. At 8 o'clock on a Friday night, the streets were empty. And I'm walking around thinking, what is this? What's, what's wrong here? You know? I get back to the hotel, and I'm having this major allergy attack. Sneezing, my eyes are watering, all this. Well, it turns out that the day that I arrived was the one year anniversary of the day the Soviet tanks rolled into town. And there had been a demonstration, and the authorities had put a curfew. First of all, they disbanded the demonstration with tear gas. That's what I was feeling the after effects of the tear gas. So it was this ironic thing. The next day, Saturday, I was wa went out walking there too. The streets were packed, just like today. And it was like, you know, people were suddenly allowed out after the curfew. And three times, I was, as I was walking down that street, some young man, I was about like 22 or 25 then, some young man came up to me, you know, three times, young men came up to me and wanted to buy my Levi's that I was wearing. And they offered me the equivalent of $75 then, when I paid $4 for them in the US. And I wish I had a whole suitcase full of them to sell. <laughs> but that was, it was like an epiphany for me. I thought, this system is going to collapse. You know, when that kind of thing happens, you know, this, this Soviet occupation really is not really going to last forever. Still, when 1989 came, it was still a shock when it finally did end. But so that was, you know, what, it, what it, the point of this is that it, it wasn't all that military might that changed things as much as the cultural exchange and all, and people like Ginsburg challenging everything, and people like you know, many other American dissenters doing that. And of course, you know, one of the um, major movements in American history was the American Revolution, and some people say this is like the second, I mean, the second American Revolution was the Civil Rights Movement, in which people were you know, protesting against the Jim Crow laws and really pushing the United States to be true to its ideals. And, you know, and, and one of the things about dissent in the United States is that so many people, in the 1950s when I grew up, uh, I was taught in school every day that the United States is the greatest country on earth and the Soviet Union is like the evil empire. And so you kind of believe this. And I, I was thinking, I'm so happy and lucky and grateful that I'm born in the freest country. And yet you see things like this, and you realize, wait, something doesn't gel here. You know, are we really free when people have to fight for the right to sit in the front of a bus or have a coffee at a lunch counter or vote? And so there was this sense with my generation that America has these great ideals, and we love those ideals, but we're not there yet. And so I think what happened in the 60s is that so many people began to fight, both consciously and unconsciously, to make the reality more closely resemble that ideal the way we think of ourselves. We want to make this country into what we claim to be. And, you know, Birmingham in 1963, Selma in 1965. And then I just want to close this with this little excerpt. Now, you know, on April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated. You know, a very pivotal year for the world. You know, it starts off with the Tet Offensive, and then Martin Luther King's assassination. Uh, you have Columbia Uprising, the Sorbonne in Paris, Robert Kennedy's 
assassinated Prague, August 68. All of this happened in Mexico City in the autumn, uh, an extremely pivotal year. And the night before his assassination, he gave his last speech. And I just wanted to we'll finish up with this little two minute clip from that speech. To have some questions. We say to America, if we true to what you say on paper. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Any questions? Everybody all worked up here. <laughs> well, maybe, yeah. maybe if I can ask you, because you've made a, a, a really strong point here. I mean, it's a fascinating discussion. Uh, but you've made this point about the Constitution and, and, uh, and dissent being somehow connected to the ideals that are in the Constitution. And I'm curious. What does it mean in a society where there isn't a constitution, where there aren't those ideals? Is the sense still the same? Is it something different? Well, and probably in some ways it's far more difficult and, um, and far more dangerous to the sense because, um, you know, I guess the point is, is that it's so important that dissent should be respected. And of course, this is you know the basic principle, one of the basic principles in the United States. Uh, but you have uh, you certainly civil rights movement or other these other things, you know, you go to you know Nazi Germany, do you think Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King would have been able to do any nonviolent disobedience or anything? You know, it's just so it wouldn't happen. Uh, and of course, what's happened in the history of Czechoslovakia pretty serious stuff going on when people are trying to resist the Nazi occupation or the Soviet occupation. Um, 
but it's you know still I think that dissent is really important for any society, and actually any healthy society would recognize that dissent is a way to allow people to express you know their discontent with it. You know, if people you know, if you go back to like, like Theodore Roosevelt once said, people you know, his critics always thought of him as a this radical because he wanted to reform things, but he felt that if you don't reform things, you're going to get a revolution. You know, it's, it's important to uh, you know, make things more equitable for people, even if it's you know, really impossible. <coughs> yes. Do it up. Yes. Uh, when I asked John Baez if she had some kind of personal mantra about you know, her approach to social change, she said, tiny victories, great defeats. I'm just curious about your own personal mantras mm -hmm. and can share them with us. Yeah. Well, uh, it's one of the things that you know, I, agree with, I agree with. In a sense, it's, it's a couple of things that I will tell my students you know, when we're talking about this, and that is, uh, first of all, uh, be a part of your time. Be very connected to what's going on. I mean, sometimes in America you might have like a demonstration now and people are going out and trying to emulate what happened in the 60s. Well, that's gone. You better be you know, dealing with the problems for today. The other thing is that it really is going to take a lot of people. A lot of people have to gather together and force change. You know, one person alone can't change the world. I remember I... The other famous dissenter that I met was Pete Seeger. And um, I was talking with him one day, this is back in 1988, at this Clearwater Folk Festival that he does every year, did every year. Uh, and someone asked him, can you change the world with a song? And he said, no, I can't change the world with a song. <coughs> but if I write a song, someone else gives a speech, and someone else leads a teaching, and someone else paints a poster, and someone else leads a march. Together, we can change the world. And this is, has become sort of a mantra to me in a way. And it's also the, the expression that we've used a lot in America that I find very salient is, you know, think locally, uh, think globally, but act locally. I probably heard of that too. You want to change everything, but you can only deal with what's right in front of you. What's the problem that you're fight facing today that your society is facing? Yeah. Um, I was wondering a bit when you talked about um, social media having kind of replaced um, protest songs in a way these days. And to me, uh, I see a danger because. When you look at Facebook, there are a lot of selfies. There's a lot of focus on the individual, on me being kind of out there. Mm -hmm. But there's not much focus on dissent, per se. Mm -hmm. so, so I see yeah. danger. Uh, so I, I was wondering how with your, with your kind of reaction. Yeah, I, I mentioned, I, I talk about that briefly in the very end of the book, because I think the verdict or the jury is still out on social media, because like it can, I think it can be a incredible force for change. Uh, and it can you know, get people to know, you, you can have like flash demonstrations, for example. But there's also this uh, problem of what some people are calling clicktivism or slacktivism, where you can click like for something and you think you've participated. And it's not exactly the same as the people going out and marching across the Atlantic Bridge in Selma, Alabama in 1965. But, you know, so it, it can get, I think, people more involved and more active, uh, but it can also diffuse it as well by thinking, okay, every, you know, we've got a million likes and now the cause is not, and nobody's really done anything. So there is that point. I think, you know, it's, it's kind of fascinating because I think we're going to see in the next years, you know, what kind of effect this has. Anyone else? Yes. Um, you spoke about the, the uh, historical similarities you can see between different um, eras and areas of dissent. Um, I'm, also, I'm aware that you 
couldn't have formed an opinion this quickly on the Baltimore riots. Um, I was wondering if you've noticed anything that you feel is aligned to anything that you yeah. That's a good question because Christoph mentioned to me yesterday the Baltimore riots, and that's the first thing, you know, since I've been here for a couple of days, I haven't been looking at the New York Times or anything, so. Uh, but it seems to me like, you remember that sign I said, I still can't believe we have to protest this shit? I think it's stuff that's still going on. What's happening in the United States today with Ferguson and Baltimore and all of these things, this is part of, and this is something I didn't even mention, but like all dissent movements have counter dissent movements. You know, once one dissent movement starts gaining ground, there's a very powerful anti that movement. Like the women's suffrage movement spawned an anti suffrage movement. And this police brutality is, is basically white backlash against the civil rights movement. And it started with Attica in 1971. You guys remember Attica, or you know, there's a prison riot there, and the police, the state troopers brutally put it down. And uh, the same year that Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act in 1965, he signed a, a, an act to get tough on crime. And of course, in the United States, getting tough on crime is basically code for like states' rights used to be, you know, with you know, keeping them in their place. And I think that's what's happening, and I think you're getting a lot of the backlash against that backlash now, with people just absolutely frustrated. You know, if, uh, I think it was James Baldwin once said that if you are black, I think he used the word Negro back then, but you know, if you are Negro and at all conscious, you are living in a state of rage. think of American dream, what that means to me are basically the principles written down in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. You know, I, I believe that. I believe we're all created equal. I mean, everybody's got different abilities and all of that, but you know, on that inner level, there's really no difference between people. And that I think it's very important that people, you know, respect that with everybody else. And you know, you know, back in the 1960s, you know, I was part of that generation that felt, you know, we can change the world. You know, we can, you know, use our efforts and our strength to create a more equal and just society. And you know, perhaps it was very naive. You know, and. and and say it is naive to do that, but I don't want to lose that naive. You know, I'm, I'm cynical enough about enough things. And, and I, I think that's one reason why there are, are around the world today when people are very angry with America, it's not so much those principles they're angry with. They're angry that the United States isn't living up to its own principles. They're angry that we are breaking our own basic beliefs. I was going to ask you, as another person of the 60s, um, how you see the role of the courts as re taking back all the things we thought we achieved. Yeah, well, this is part of, you know, the, the backlash, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe, uh, you know, what was it, Hegel, you know, the dialectical materialism is always, you, you get to some advances and then there's the pushback and there's just this constant thing going on. Uh, you know, maybe like, you know, wave theory in physics or something that they're constantly, um, you know, 
but you know, in some ways, you think that you know you maybe make two steps ahead, but then there's a step back, and then you have to keep pushing. Yeah, right, right, right now it might be two two steps ahead, and two and a half back. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting. Like in the 1920s, Margaret Sanger really fought for the right for you know reproductive rights that women should be able to have access to birth control and all of this and has been pushed back even against that and it's kind of shocking 90 years later that the uh, the birth control movement is facing a crisis even it's kind of a uh, uh, it's uh, kind of a follow-up question to this. Uh, it's like you are talking about this and as being, you know, the progressive force. Uh, it's almost like in sort of Star Wars, like black and white, um, uh, black and white vision, uh, which you know, uh, which is which is very interesting. I'm sorry that I have to ask the question about the arguments, you know, because you see the descent as this like progressive idea going through the main history. Like, what do you think, I, you know, is the uh, counterweighting sort of like dark force? Well, you know, basically, uh, I think that dissent is the fuel for the engine of progress. And I think it should be a progressive force, but there is always these countervailing forces. You know, it's not an easy struggle, it's not an easy fight. And another thing that you know, I, I spend a lot of time at the beginning of the book trying to define what dissent is. Does, you know, if you define dissent as having a moral value to it, but is there such a thing as good dissent or bad dissent? I mean, you think of, as historians, you know, you look at something, you see an event that happens, and you think, oh, this has been really good. It's a lot of progress, but then 20 years down the road, that event maybe causes something else that is the opposite of that. And there's like these unintended consequences and then you have to kind of rewrite and re-examine and reevaluate and reanalyze what has happened. So it's not exactly, uh, it's never a steady force. But I do think that, for example, you know, in the United States, that we are probably in a better place now than we were 250 years ago. Uh, when Jefferson wrote, we were talking about this yesterday in class, when Jefferson wrote, all men are created equal, who did he mean? He didn't mean all men, did he? Who did he not mean? Blacks, women, People Indians. People without property. He meant, you know, rich white slaveholders like him were equal with members of parliament. But, you know, in the 1820s, property qualifications for voting were dropped in the United States so poor white men could vote. In 1870, black men got the right to vote. You know, 1920, women. You know, so, and I, I think of American history in some ways as a slow, in fits and starts, unfolding of that phrase. So that today, all men are created equal means a bigger thing than it did back then. What do you think is or was the most important dissent movement in the past 10 years? Do you see anything which could potentially have, according to you, long-lasting uh, consequences? In the last 10 years? You know, actually, believe it or not, I think the Occupy movement, even though it flopped, but it's, I think it was just the beginning of, as economic inequality increases and increases, you know, when you think back to the labor movement, there was, back in the 1820s they tried, and it was defeated in the 1860s. You know, it, took, it took more than 100 years for like, miners to get unionized. Uh, and you know, there's lots of problems with that too, but uh, you have movements that come up and they get beaten down, but then they rise up again later. And I think that uh, the, one of the biggest issues in the United States today is this economic inequality. Also, I would say that one of the incredible successes, and this shows another thing about you know, the fits and starts, 
is the um, gay rights. In just the last few years, that you even have like conservative Republicans in America now becoming all right with same-sex marriage and all that. They might still have problems with it, but uh, you know, when you think of the civil rights movement, how long it took to get some real progress there, and you know, in the gay rights, it was like nothing happened for the longest time, and then just suddenly in the last couple of years, you know, even President Obama says he changed his mind. Maybe he had already made up his mind beforehand, but politically, but you know, it really is happening very quickly. Okay. Unfortunately, on today's New York Times front page, there's a story about the Supreme Court splitting mm -hmm. on this whole gay rights issue that they are mm -hmm. now considering. Well, you see, that's, you know, that can be a setback, you know, but at the same time, you think, <laughs> It, it, can be a, it can be a setback, but at the same time, that's one person. If it's a five to four vote, you know, that, that's, not the, that's not what the people are saying. And, and, you know, eventually, you know, the force of time and history, that will get, even if the gay rights thing gets reversed right now, that will get reversed. Yes, question. Uh, I would like to ask a question on possibility of teaching this, this dissenting skills. And there is a school very behind, it's New York University in Opera. And there's one teacher, and this is the only one in Opera. And this is the only one who I know who teaches the subject of art of defeat. And he was death time for the revolution for years, so one of the really tough dissidents, and one of the best, and very close to us. And this is this is the only teacher who teaches subjects. So can you imagine? Is it even possible to teach the dissent ability of this kind of stuff? Uh, to teach dissent where? Dissent ability, whatever you want to call it. Um, mm -hmm. How to be able to play your responsible role in the society and be able to dissent and disagree. And should it be even teach or is it teach? Is it being taught? You mean the actual, like I'm talking about, you know, the history of it, but you mean the actual, like, like workshops and how to go out and... Yeah, well, question, yeah. yeah, well, it can be done and it's been done. And uh, I think it's been done in, you know, pretty much all societies. I mean, think of, uh, I mean, just go back to the Nazi occupation here and the underground. I mean, these are people that are figuring out ways to resist and, and protest against what's going on and to try to reverse things. Uh, in the United States, we've had places like uh, Highlander Folk School in Tennessee that started in the 1930s, holding workshops for workers to show them how to use new tactics like the sit-down strike and all of this. And, you know, actual hands-on methods of dissent. Uh, and eventually they started working by the 40s with civil rights activists. And you know, in the States today, there are still plenty of these kinds of organizations. And I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if there's organizations like this in the Czech Republic. What do you think about uh, American government's reaction to dissents like uh, Snowden or Assange? Yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's very good. Because basically, I think that all American presidents and congresses, they always give lip service to dissent. Oh, that's one of our great things. I mean, remember two days ago when I met the ambassador Christoph introduced me and he said that, uh, you know, dissent is one of America's great attributes, you know, and it is. I mean, all politicians will say that while doing everything they can behind the scenes to, to repress it, you know, like during the uh, Democratic and Republican conventions in the last few years, uh, city power structures, they create free speech zones where protesters can go a mile away from the convention hall to protest. You know, there's nothing in the Constitution about a free speech zone. <laughs> so, you know, it's part of the hypocrisy. You know, people in power don't want to give up any of it. Yeah. And dissenters are basically nudging them along.
pushing them reluctantly. So, any more? Uh, yes. Sorry, my French is really shy, but she would like to ask you. Uh, <laughs> she would like to ask you, how was it when you met Allen Ginsberg? Oh, it's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> you guys want me to tell you my Allen Ginsberg story? <laughs> well, we probably should. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we still have like five minutes. Five more minutes. Okay, I'll try to do it. <laughs> Even then, you can take a story. It was. It was. I can tell you exactly. It was February first, nineteen eighty, and uh, I was new to Philadelphia at the time. I had been living in Europe for a number of years, and I had just come back. And a friend of mine was the manager of a folk club in Philadelphia called the Main Point, and it was a place about the size of this room, which were the higher you know, musicians to come and they would play and people would come sit and drink coffee and listen and it would be people like Joni Mitchell and Doc Watson and all that I've seen there. Anyway, uh, he had booked Allen Ginsberg to do some poetry reading and uh, he asked, he called me up, this friend called me up and asked me could I pick up Allen Ginsberg at the airport. So I said sure. And so I drove down to the Philadelphia airport came in on a flight from Denver. He was teaching at the Naropa Institute in Boulder, Colorado at the time. And it was funny, I'm standing there waiting for him to come out of the, the door there, of the, from, you know, the, what do they call it, the, uh, the gangway. And, you know, of course I knew what he looked like and he didn't know what I looked like. And I'm kind of like looking around like this and just as he comes through, just as I recognize him and I'm about to motion to him, he waves at me, and of course I had long hair and a beard at the time, so I guess I maybe looked like I was coming to meet him. Like he, as if he recognized me before I recognized him. So he came over and he said, "I'm Alan Ginsberg," and I could I wanted to say, "Of course you are," but I said, uh, "I'm Ralph Young," and we shook hands and he introduced me to Peter Orlovsky, his lover who was always with him. And then we went, we got his baggage, and we got in the car and we were driving into town. And in Philadelphia, uh, Walt Whitman was connected with Philadelphia and Camden, New Jersey, and there's a bridge there called the Walt Whitman Bridge. And I'm sitting in the car driving past this and not knowing how much Ginsburg knew about Philadelphia, but thinking here, uh, I've got the greatest American poet of the 20th century sitting in my car, and there's the greatest American poet of the 19th century's bridge. And I said, hey, there's the Walt Whitman Bridge. And he said, do you know how it got its name? And I said, no. He said, well, the bridge was being built in the Daughters of the American Revolution, which is a very conservative group in America, wanted to name it the Walt Whitman Bridge. But then they found out he was a faggot. This was Ginsburg's own words. They found out he was a faggot. So they decided they have to call it the Joyce Kilmer Bridge, another New Jersey bridge. And then he said, and then they found out he was a faggot too. <laughs> <laughs> so then they decided to call for the Walt Whitman. <laughs> so then we're, we're driving along and um, he was the whole time in the car, he was sitting in the car, popping cloves of garlic, whole cloves he was eating. He was on this health food kick. <laughs> so you can imagine what the car smelled like. And, uh, and I asked him, what is he doing now? What's his thing? And he was on the way to the gig. And um, he, he had a harmonium on his lap. You know, the harmonium is like a keyboard, and you squeeze it. It's, I think it comes from India or something. And he says his, his project right now is to put the songs, the poems of William Blake to music, because William Blake is one of his major influences. So here we are sitting, it happened to be a, a warm day, windows were partly open and we're in a traffic jam and he's sitting in the car playing this and singing tiger tiger burning bright into the dark and you know, all these people in cars are looking at us <laughs> and it was just so wonderfully eccentric and then we get to the place and we have lunch together and I wound up spending the entire afternoon and evening talking with him he did two sets during the evening. I sat there for both of them. And um, we had just some great conversations. We talked about Bob Dylan. 
and what he was up to, and just so many different things. And I felt so inspired, and he was so natural. So, you know, I don't know, maybe he was hitting on me for all I know. But he seemed like not like some kind of celebrity at all. But he eventually, you know, um, he knew I was working at a bookstore at the time, secondhand bookstore. So he asked me if he could, if I could find him a couple of books, uh, to the Child English Ballads and George Saintsbury's History of English Prosody. And so we exchanged addresses and all that. And then a few weeks later, I I found the books. I wrote him, told him I had them, and and basically that they would cost just what we paid for them. And and I said, by the way, you're you know, talking the other day was such an inspiration for me. I decided I had to get back into writing. I'd been writing for a while and had to abandon it. And I've got to, I wanted to get back into writing. And also, a poem that you did about the death of your father really touched me because it reminded me so much of you know, the experience I had when my father was dying a few years before. And he, had, he mentioned at the time it hadn't been published yet. And I said, you let me. When, do, when is it going to get published? So a couple of weeks later, I get a letter from him in the mail with a check for the books. And uh, just telling me a couple more books that he wanted to get and uh, thanks for the discount and blah, blah, blah. And then in the letter were five pages with this poem written out and do you want signed. Me, do you want me to show them or no? I don't, I don't think I, I, I have it on a flash drive. Uh, you send it to me by email, so I can... You have it? Yeah, go ahead. Right. So it's going to take like two minutes. That's all right. So anyway, the long story short, for the next eight years or so, I had a correspondence with Ginsburg. We would write back and forth, and he would ask for books, and I would send them. Every once in a while, I would get a postcard or a letter. And he... Um, do you have them all a separate page? Because I put it together as a <laughs> document. It's just the title is Ginsburg, if you can find it. Um, but it was such, you know, it just kind of blew my mind to have these, I think it was five sheets of paper where he had typed out the poem, but on each poem he wrote, you know, to Ralph Young from Allen Ginsburg. So I, I've, I've, often, I've often thought I should probably get those framed and, and hung up there, kind of very valuable. So, okay, yeah, there's, this is, uh, you can read the letter. Thanks for your letter, yes, please do send me a child out as blah, blah, blah. And then this is the, uh, the title page of the poem, and then don't grow old. He says the rest, okay. It was like a total of three poems. And, and just some, just the, these are just uh, you know, a few of the letters that I And then once, every once in a while, you get a postcard in the mail asking for a book or something. Yeah, that's it. So any other questions, or are we, should we wrap it up? Or? Yes. I, I have one. You uh, described Alan Ginsberg when he was both like a uh, very strong individualist and also political. I don't know, as you said, but I have a question. If, uh, are not those, like, to human qualities like contrary to each other or on the contrary is like this uh, independent irony uh, also a motivating force for, or driving force for a business? Well, you know, that's one of the kind of ultimate questions of 
the human existence, what is personal, what is political. And, you know, I, I remember when, during, I lived in Germany for a while, and during the, uh, in the 70s, and I was constantly getting into arguments with German radical Marxist students who always <laughs> say that anything that's personal is counter-revolutionary, and it's kind of this, this basic Moscow line that was being given. And uh, the attitude that you get from somebody like Ginsburg or the Romantics or the Transcendentalists or a lot of the 1960s movements is that the individual is very important and the only way to ensure that the individual can realize his full potential is that the society is equitable. And that, you know, like you, you protest, say, against the Jim Crow laws because they are preventing people from experiencing their full individuality. I mean, to me, I don't see a contradiction between uh, revolution, so to speak, for society and the inner revolution. And one of the things I remember many times back in the 60s when I was in college and we would get into these bull sessions where we'd sit up like all night long talking about is there a God or you know, different you know, philosophical, theological concepts. And one of the big arguments in the 60s was you know, we need a revolution. We've got to change the owners of the means of production. And then there were others, and I tended to lean more towards that group, except I think you need both kinds of things. But I would lean more towards that. You know, you can change the names of the people who are in charge, but nothing changes unless something changes in here, unless consciousness changes. And, you know, this to me is, you know, you can't have the outer revolution without the inner but that's just my opinion. Okay, okay. so uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So it's uh, something to look forward to, and 
The last thing is like to somebody's question, you know, about these workshops on descent. Okay? Uh, for example, on Friday the 8th, you know, it's going to be a very non-violent, peaceful event. I'm taking my kids there and stuff. Uh, but we will have the signs, you know, we will have the speakers, so you can bring your own sort of like music, you can, you know, bring your own ideas to this. Uh, so, and it can be a sort of like, for those who want to, you know, it can be a uh, little workshop. Um, on that. So without further ado, let me open the uh, champagne. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 